we now move to the last head of income which is income from other sources IFOS. Now what kind of income is taxable under this head? So every kind of income is taxable under this head if 1. It is not excluded from the total income that is it is not exempt it is taxable and 2. It is not taxable under any other head of income so IFOS is the residual head of income. However, certain incomes are specifically taxable under this head. For example, gifts, winnings, etc. We will look at these incomes as we proceed ahead. Snapshot chart highlighting the steps to compute income under this head. First, we figure out the amounts chargeable under this head. Section 56 is relevant. Then we allow deductions on two counts basically under Section 57. Specific deduction and general deduction. A specific deduction is a specific to certain kinds of income. We will look at this as we proceed. General deduction is what we need to look here. We need to note this carefully because wherever we encounter the term general deduction in our discussion, this is what we mean. It refers to any expenditure not being in the nature of capital expenditure. That means revenue laid out or expended wholly and exclusively for the purpose of making or earning income. So this refers to the general deduction. Then we add amount which are not deductible which are listed in section 58. If these have been allowed as deduction, we add them back because these are not allowed as deduction. We add deemed incomes which are provided under section 59 and this results in income taxable under this head. Now we need to note that if an income has been received after deduction of TDS, then it needs to be grossed up for inclusion in the total income. And the formula is income received in 200 divided by within brackets 100 minus rate of TDS. So we gross up and then we include that grossed up income while computing the total income. So we first move to the income in the nature of dividend. It is defined under section 222. There are two categories. Category A <clears throat> refers to distributions made by a company to its shareholders and clauses A, B, C, D. 222A, what is treated as dividend, distribution of accumulated profits if it entails release of assets of the company. For example, cash dividend is distributed. But we need to note that if bonus shares are issued to equity shareholders, that is not treated as dividend. So that is not taxable as dividend in the hands of the shareholders. Clause B, Distribution to shareholders of debentures, debenture stock or deposit certificates with or without interest. Second, distribution to preference shareholders of bonus shares. It is treated as dividend. Clause C. Distribution to shareholders of a company on its liquidation. That is treated as dividend. But distribution in respect of preference shares issued for full cash consideration is not treated as dividend. Clause D. Distribution to shareholders on reduction of capital is treated as dividend. But same, distribution in respect of preference shares issued for full cash consideration is not treated as dividend. We also need to make a note that payment which is made by the company on buyback of shares is not treated as dividend. Rather, we discuss this in the topic on capital gain that either buyback tax is payable by the company or if that is not the case, then capital gain is levyable in the hands of the shareholder but it is not treated as dividend. What if the distribution is not of money but it is of assets? Then the market value of the asset is taken as the amount of dividend. Now there is a limit to which the amount is treated as dividend under section 222. So these, these above listed items under clauses A, B, C, D are treated as dividend to the extent to which the company possesses accumulated profits. Whether they may be capitalized or not, it doesn't matter but the overall limit is accumulated profits. So if the accumulated profits of the company is 1 lakh and dividend is distributed to the extent of 1.5 lakh, then dividend will be treated to the extent of 1 lakh. The other uh, 50,000 component which is in excess of accumulated profits will not be taxable because it will be taken to be on account of distribution of capital, not of accumulated profits. Category B is covered by section 222E and it is referred to as deemed dividend. It covers payments made by a closely held company. Closely held company. What is a closely held company? It is a company which is not a widely held company. 
In other words, it is not a company in which the public are substantially interested. What we need to note basically is private companies or public unlisted companies fall under this category of closely held company or CHC. <clears throat> so three kinds of payments are covered A, B, C. First we look at any payment which is by way of advance or loan. So if an advance or loan is given by a closely held company to whom? Category A. Where the payment is made to a shareholder. Which shareholder? Who is the beneficial owner of equity shares holding 10% or more of voting power? Right? So this is the CHC. This is the CHC, closely held company. And it is giving a loan or advance to a shareholder who say holds 10% of equity share capital in the company. So being at 10% or more of the voting power which the shareholder holds in the company, the payment of loan or advance will be treated as deemed dividend under section 222E in the hands of such shareholder. Second, payment to any concern. Concern means HUF, firm, AOP, BOI or company. In which the shareholder, which shareholder referred in category A is a member, say a, mem say a member of HUF or a shareholder or a partner in the firm and in which he has a substantial interest. Say the shareholder has a substantial interest in a concern. Say this is a firm and this shareholder has a substantial interest in the firm. Okay. And the company, closely held company, and the shareholder holds 10% in closely held company. And if this closely held company gives a loan or advance to the concern, then that will be treated as deemed dividend. So the question is, what is the meaning of substantial interest? If it is a case of a company, then the person has a substantial interest. If he is the beneficial owner of equity shares carrying 20% or more of the voting power. If it, is a, if it is a case other than a company, then the person has a substantial interest if at any time during the previous year he is beneficially entitled to 20% or more of the income of such concern. So if in this example the shareholder has is entitled to say 20% profits in the firm and he holds 10% shares in the company and if the company is giving a loan or advance to the firm then that will be treated as deemed dividend. Now in both cases A and B there is an exception. Even if the case is covered under A or B, it is still not treated as deemed dividend. It is not treated as deemed dividend if it is made by a company in the ordinary course of its business and the lending of money is a substantial part of the business of the company. So if the closely held company in our example, if that is say a money lending company or a company whose main business is that of money lending, then the grant of loan or advance will not be treated as deemed dividend. Category C, payment to any person. Any payment which is made on behalf or for the individual benefit of the shareholder referred in category A and the payment can be made to any person that is treated as deemed dividend. So if this is the case of any other person and the payment is made by the company for say on behalf of the shareholder, this shareholder or for the individual benefit of this shareholder, then this payment will be treated as deemed dividend under section 222E. Now in all these cases ABC, the payment is treated as dividend to the extent to, to the extent of accumulated profits of the company. That is profits of the company up to the date of payment. So to this extent, amount is treated as deemed dividend. Beyond this extent, it is not treated as deemed dividend. Set off. Any dividend paid by a company which is set off against any previous payment which was treated as dividend under 222E is not again treated as dividend to the extent it is so set off. So if loan or advance was given under 222E of say 1 lakh which was earlier treated as dividend under 222E and subsequently dividend say a regular dividend of 1.5 lakh is declared to, and this is uh, what the shareholder is entitled to but since 1 lakh after setting of 1 lakh say only, 15, 000, only 50 thousand is paid to the shareholder out of this 1.5 lakh 1 lakh which is actually set off will not be treated as dividend once again only 50 thousand which is the excess will be treated as dividend this is to avoid double taxation of the same amount 
Now, what about trade advances which are in the nature of commercial transactions? These are not covered under Section 222E and accordingly not taxable as dividend in the hands of the shareholder. What is the deduction that is allowed in computing dividend income? Deduction is allowed only on account of interest expense. No other deduction is allowed. Even on this count, there is a limit. <clears throat> so we need to determine the amount of dividend income that is finally included in the total income for that year without such deduction of interest expense. Then we compute 20% and that is the limit. So up to this limit, interest expense is allowed as a deduction. So this is the only deduction allowable from dividend income. Taxation of dividend income. It is taxable in the hands of the shareholder. It is not taxable in the hands of the company. And dividend is taxable at regular rates plus applicable surcharge we add and of course 4% health and education says. We have already noted in the topic on rate on tax that rate of surcharge on tax on dividend income cannot exceed 15% in the case of an individual HUF, AOP, BUI or AJP. Now there are certain special provisions for distribution of assets by a company in liquidation. So as we noted above, 222C distribution to shareholders of a company on its liquidation is treated as dividend and therefore it is taxable in the hands of the shareholder to the extent of accumulated profits. Okay. Now what are the tax implications in the hands of the company? There is distribution of assets of the company to its shareholders and liquidation but it is not regarded as a transfer for the purpose of capital gain. Therefore, there is no capital gain which arises in the hands of the company. But capital gain arises in the hands of the shareholder instead when the shareholder receives any money or other assets from the company in lieu of shares. What we also need to note is that the distribution made to the shareholders by the company is treated as dividend under section 222c as we noted above to the extent of accumulated profits. Now when capital gain arises, we compute capital gain as follows. First we determine the full value of consideration which is what? Money which is received by the shareholder from the company. In case of assets, the market value of other assets as on the date of distribution. And we deduct the amount which has been assessed as dividend under section 222c to avoid double deduction. 222c becomes dividend taxable in the hands of shareholders and the balance uh, of the consideration becomes the full value of consideration for computing capital gain. We deduct expenditure on transfer if any. What about cost of acquisition and index cost of acquisition of shares? Of shares. In such case, the period of holding is reckoned up to which date? Up to the date on which the company goes into liquidation. And then accordingly, we arrive at the amount of capital gain taxable in the hands of the shareholder. We will now look at the provisions regarding taxation of gifts. And this is section 56.2x. 56 Money or property which is received without consideration, that means as a gift, or for inadequate consideration. First, we look at the applicability of section 56.2x. 56.2x applies where any person receives the following in any previous year from any person or persons. And there are three categories A, B and C. First we look at category A. This refers to or this deals with any sum of money. Okay. Which is received without consideration. That means money received as a gift. Now we need to look at the aggregate value of such sum during the previous year. If it is greater than 50,000. For example, if 60,000 has been received as a gift during the previous year, then the whole of the aggregate value of such sum is taxable. That means in this case 60,000, the whole of the amount, the whole of 60,000 will become taxable under 56.2x. If this is not the case, then it is not taxable. For example, if the sum of money received as gift is 40,000, then it is not more than 50,000, so it is not taxable. Category B covers movable property. Covers movable property. What is the movable property for this purpose? It is a capital asset of the SSE which is listed under 128 as you can see on your screen. And this is referred to as a specified movable property. If it is a case of any other movable property, then it is not taxable under 56 x 
but it is a space but if it is a specified movable property that means the capital asset of the sse being shares and securities or jewelry or archaeological collections or drawings paintings sculptures any work of art or bullion and this is the acronym which you can use for your reference DAPSAJ, DAPSAJ within brackets OS, right? This is the same as you would recollect while we were dealing with the uh, definition of capital asset in the topic on capital gain. Plus, BS is the addition here, B for Boolean and S for shares and securities. So DAPSAJ, OS plus BS. So, in the case of specified movable property, there can be two situations, B1 and B2. B1, where the specified movable property is received without consideration, that means as a gift. Then we need to see whether the aggregate fair market value of such property is greater than 50,000. Right? Say, for example, gold is received is of value 60,000. Then in that case, whole of the aggregate FMV is taxable, so 60,000 will become taxable. But if that is not the case, say gold is received of fair market value 40,000, then it will not be taxable under 56.2x. B2 category is where the specified movable property is received for consideration. Okay, that means for inadequate consideration. Then we need to figure out the excess, which is what? Aggregate fair market value minus consideration. And we need to check whether that is more than 50,000, right? For example, a fair market value of gold which is received is 1 lakh, okay? And rupees 20,000 has been charged. So the excess is 80,000. 80,000 is more than 50,000. So such excess, which is 80,000, will be taxable. If that is not the case, if the amount paid is 60,000, so the excess is 40,000, which is not more than 50,000, so it will not be taxable. Now we move to category C which covers immovable property which means what land or building or both the condition is that it should be a capital asset of the SSE just like movable property for immovable property also it needs to be a capital asset of the SSE which is receiving this property c1 covers a case where it is received without consideration that means as a gift then we need to check stamp duty value sdv if it is more than 50000 or not for example if sdv is 1 lakh it is more than 50,000, then SDV of 1 lakh is taxable. If that is not the case, for example, if SDV is 40,000, it is not more than 50,000, so it is not taxable. C2 covers a case where the immobile property is received for a consideration. Then we need to figure out the amount of excess. Excess is what? A stamp duty value minus the consideration. And we need to check whether that is more than 50,000. Further, the second condition is that whether the SDV is more than 110% of consideration. For example, if SDV is 20 lakh and the consideration is 10 lakh. So excess is 20 lakh minus 10 lakh is equal to 10 lakh and 10 lakh is more than 50,000. First condition is satisfied. Second condition, SDV of 20 lakh is more than 110% of consideration of 10 lakh. That is also satisfied. So both the conditions are satisfied. In that case, the excess, the excess is what? 20 lakh minus 10 lakh, 10 lakh. So 10 lakh becomes taxable. If both these conditions are not satisfied, then it is not taxable under 56.2x. Now, as regards immobile property, we will recollect the provisions of 43 CA and 50 C. 43 CA and 50 C apply while determining full value of consideration in the case of the transferer. If the land or building is a stock in trade, then full value of consideration 43 CA, 43 CA applies. If it is a capital asset, 50 C applies. Now there are two provisions of 43C and 50C which equally apply to 56.2x. And what are they? First, SDV on date of agreement can be taken instead of SDV on date of registration. If the consideration, maybe whole or any part, is received by a specified mode on or before the date of agreement. Second provision, which is similar to 43C and 50C is that AO can refer the valuation of the property to the valuation officer where the SSE claims that SDV is more than FMV and he has not disputed the SDV in any forum. In such case, the value determined by valuation officer is taken. But if the value so determined is even more than SDV, then SDV is taken and the valuation of valuation officer is not considered. Now, there could be a situation where the income is arising outside India. 
on account of a sum of money which is covered under section 56 2x right sum of money category a so income is arising out of india why because the sum of money is paid by a resident in india to a non resident okay not being a company or if it is a company then to a foreign company so that means income is arising outside india but in that case such income is deemed to accrue or arise in india under section 9 and therefore it becomes taxable in in india for such non resident as well now certain points to note in this respect 562x the limit of 50000 that we noted above in the chart applies separately for each of the five categories a b1 b2 c1 c2 a b1 any movable property gift and receive for consideration c a movable property in this case c1 was without consideration gift and c2 was for consideration so a b1 b2 c1 and c2 so the limit of 50000 is not the aggregate for all these categories put together it applies separately to each of these categories second in the case of immovable property the sdv per property is considered it is not the aggregate for all the properties put together for the previous year but for sum of money as well as for movable properties in those categories we were checking the aggregate for the previous year third income is not taxable under this provision if the property is not the capital asset of the ssc even if it is the capital asset of the donor receipt of any movable property other than the specified movable property is not taxable because it is not covered under this provision for example if a mobile phone is received furniture is received a car is received what about fixed deposit in a bank if it is assigned without any consideration then there are two views view 1 it is not a specified movable property it is not listed as a specified movable property and it is thus not covered under 562x but view 2 is that it may be said to be a sum of money and therefore it is covered whatever view you adopt it is good to give a note in term in support of this assumption in your answer there are certain cases specified where 562x is not applicable So 562x is not applicable to any sum of money or any property which is received in the following cases and now we will look at those cases quickly. Number 1 where it is received from any relative and what is the meaning of relative in case of an individual who is the relative a spouse of the individual is a relative. So if the individual receives gift of money from the spouse even if it is more than 50000 it is not taxable under 562x because the spouse is the relative brother or sister of the spouse is a relative and a spouse of the brother or the sister is also a relative then a lineal ascendant or descendant of the spouse and further the spouses of such lineal ascendant or descendant is also a relative next brother or sister of the individual and their spouses parent of the individual brother or sister of either of the parent as well as their spouses any lineal ascendant or descendant as well as their spouses all of these are treated as relative of the individual so if the individual receives a sum of money or any property from a relative it is not taxable under 562x as far as the huf is concerned 562x doesn't apply if the huf is receiving money or property from a member of such huf second on the occasion of the marriage of the individual ssc third under a will or by way of inheritance fourth in contemplation of death of the payer or donor as the case may be fifth from any local authority defined under section 1020 sixth from any fund foundation university or other education institution hospital or other medical institution or any trust or institution referred under 1023c from or by any trust or institution but it should be registered under section 12a 12aa or 12ab from or by by any fund trust or institution university or other educational institution etc referred under 1023c by way of certain transactions not regarded as transfer under section 47 for example distribution of capital asset on the total or partial partition of huf so if a member of huf receives Uh, asset from the huf on the partition 562x will not apply from an individual by a trust 
created or established solely for the benefit of relative of the individual from persons and subject to such conditions as may be prescribed nothing has been prescribed 12 and 13 deal with the situations relating to covid 19 right so if there is an expenditure that has been incurred by an individual on the medical treatment on the medical treatment of himself or of any member of his family for what for any illness which is related to covid 19 and if he receives any reimbursement on that count from any person that amount is not taxable under 56 to x if the person has died because of illness related to covid 19 and an ex gratia payment is received by a member of the family of the deceased then there can be two situations if the amount is received from the employer of the deceased it is not uh, taxable under 56 to x second if it is received from any other person that means other than the employer then it is exempt to the extent or uh, the sum or the aggregate is not greater than 10 lakh so 10 lakh is the limit beyond 10 lakh it becomes taxable but for this exemption that means under serial number 13 two conditions need to be satisfied one the death should be within six months from date of testing covid 19 positive and second payment should be received within 12 months from the date of death now as far as number 12 and 13 are concerned what is the meaning of family so family means one either spouse and children of the individual or two parents brothers and sisters or any of them but if they are wholly or mainly dependent on the individual you may know that in the topic on salary we also discuss about covid 19 related expenditure which is reimbursed by the employer so this is a summary of covid 19 related provisions it can be either reimbursement of expenditure or ex gratia payment on death some which is received by an employee from the employer for medical treatment of self or any member of the family is covered under the head salaries but it is not taxable as perquisite and there is no limit some received by an individual from any other person not being an employer for medical treatment of self or member of family is covered under ifos but it is also not taxable and there is no limit ex gratia payment on death received by a member of the family which is received from the employer of the deceased is covered under ifos but it is not taxable and there is no limit but if it is received from any other person not being the employer of the deceased then also it is covered under ifos it is not taxable but there is a limit of exemption of 10 lakh what is the deduction which is allowed in computing income under section 56 to x general deduction is allowed which is what we noted at the beginning of this video a quick comparison between 43 ca 50 c and 56 to x this is important from an exam point of view so 43 ca applies for determining full value of consideration where we are computing business income for the seller of land or building where it is not his capital asset that means it is his stock and trade 50c is applicable to a seller of land or building where the land or building is his capital asset and 56 to x as we know is applicable to a buyer of land or building uh, but the condition is that it should be the capital asset of the recipient of the buyer when is this applicable 43 ca applies where sdv is more than 110 percent of consideration same is the case for 50c but for 56 to x where it is a case of gift 56 to x applies where sdv is more than 50000 and where it is not a case of gift it applies where two conditions are satisfied first the excess that means sdv minus consideration is more than 50000 and second sdv is more than 110% of consideration what is the tax implication in 43 ca the sdv is taken as full value of consideration okay if this condition is satisfied same for 50c for 56 to x if it is a case of gift the sdv is taxable if it is a case of receipt for consideration that means not a case of gift then the excess is taxable can sdv on the date of agreement be taken yes in all the cases can reference be made to the valuation officer for the property yes in all the cases now we look at the interplay between 56 to x and capital gain 
and questions are sometimes asked in the exam so there are a, a few angles that we need to carefully note and we need to check these angles while solving the questions so there is a case where the donor has say gifted a property or transferred a property without adequate consideration to the recipient okay now as far as the donor is concerned or the transferer is concerned what we need to note one if it is a case of gift so if d has gifted property to r then we noted in the topic on capital gains that capital gain does not arise for the transferer if it is a case of gift correct but if it is not a case of gift that means if it is a case of transfer of property for a consideration that means inadequate consideration then what will happen if d has transferred a property which is the stock in trade then business income will arise in which case full value of consideration will be determined as per what 43 ca if d has transferred a property which is a capital asset then capital gain will arise in which case if it is a case of land or building 50c will apply for determining full value of consideration if it is a case of unquoted shares we need to check 50ca fine this is clear now there are certain angles which we need to keep in mind for recipient r when r receives the property from d taxable income may arise under 562x or may not arise now where r subsequently transfers the property then capital gain will arise because it is capital asset in the hands of r right now two situations will arise we need to check what is the situation in the question where 562x applied that means where the value of the property was subject to tax under 562x in his hands then when we are computing capital gain on subsequent transfer we need to figure out the cost of acquisition what will be the cost of acquisition it will be the value which was taken into account under section 562x that will become the cost of acquisition for computing capital gain this is what this is the fair market value or the stamp duty value that was taken into account under 562x mind you it is not the excess of fmb or sdb over consideration it is the fmb or sdb that was considered while computing income taxable under 562x what about period of holding in the case of gift will we include the period of holding of the previous owner no if the case had fallen within 562x then subsequently period of holding will be based on the holding of the transferee that is r holding of previous owner that means d will not be included even if the property was received as a gift because 562x had applied at the time of receipt by r second situation is where the value of the property was not subject to tax under 562x for example d was the relative of r and therefore 562x didn't apply in the case of r in that case capital gain is determined as per the regular provisions and therefore if it is a case of gift then cost of acquisition and period of holding will be determined with reference to the previous owner as is normally done we will now look at the provisions in relation to interest now taxability depends on the category of interest and there are three possible categories category a is interest on securities interest on securities is taxable under this head if it is not taxable under the head pgvp now what does interest on securities means it means either interest on government security for example interest on government bonds or interest on debentures or other securities issued by local authority or company or its territory corporation for example interest on debentures issued by a company now interest on securities is taxable in which previous year now this depends on the system of accounting regularly employed by the sec whether it is cash or mercantile what is the deduction allowable reasonable commission or remuneration to a banker or any other person for realizing the interest is allowable as deduction further general deduction as we noted in the beginning of this topic is also allowable as deduction next is interest on compensation this covers interest received on compensation or enhanced compensation you will recollect we have already covered this in the topic on capital gain while discussing uh, section 455 uh, covering compulsory acquisition this is taxable in the previous year in which it is received so taxable on receipt basis 
flat deduction of 50% is allowed and consequently no other deduction is allowed. Category C covers other interest. So any other interest is taxable under this head. For example, interest received on fixed deposit with the bank. And the previous year in which it is taxed, it is the same as that for interest on securities. General deduction is allowable. Now we need to note certain specific items of interest incomes that is exempt. So it is not included under the headed IFOS. It is not also included in the total income. Securities, bonds or certificates issued by the central government if notified. So interest thereon is exempt. Interest on gold deposit bonds, interest on deposit certificates under the gold monetization scheme, interest on PPF, interest on Sukanya Samriddhi account, interest on 7% capital investment bonds or RBI relief bonds, interest on post office savings bank account is also exempt, but there is a limit. In case of an individual account, interest is exempt up to Rs. 3,500. And in case of a joint account, interest is exempt up to the limit of 7,000. The excess is taxable. Excess share premium is also taxable under this head and this is covered by section 56.2.7b. Now this covers a case where a closely held company receives from any person being a resident any consideration for issue of shares. So consideration is received where shares have been issued by a closely held company and the consideration is received from a resident. In such case, we need to check the consideration and the face value. If the consideration is not more than face value, then this provision is not applicable. So if you look at this diagram, this is the face value. Okay. And this is the consideration received from a resident on issue of shares. If the consideration is not greater than face value, then this provision is not applicable. But if the consideration is greater than face value, if the consideration is greater than face value, then this provision is applicable. And in such case, what is taxable? Aggregate consideration received for such shares minus FMV of the shares. So excess of consideration over the FMV is taxable. So for example, if consideration is more than the face value, but less than the fair market value, nothing is taxable under this provision. Now point to note is that income under this provision is taxable in the hands of whom? It is taxable in the hands of the company, not in the hands of the shareholder. We will now look at the other incomes taxable under the head IFOS. We will look at what are such incomes which are taxable under this head and the deduction which is allowed in computing such income under section 57. Now what we need to note in respect of deduction is that general deduction which we noted at the beginning of this topic is allowed in computing the relevant income unless it is mentioned otherwise. So we will look at certain specific deductions and by default general deduction is also allowable unless it is specifically mentioned. Units of mutual fund. Income in respect of units of a mutual fund or units of UTI, Unit Trust of India is taxable as IFOS. Deduction is allowed in respect of interest expense in a similar fashion as we saw it is allowed in respect of dividend. The same limit applies here as well. No other deduction is allowed. Second, winnings is covered under IFOS. Winnings from what? Lotteries, crossword puzzles, races, it includes horse races as well, card games and other games of any sort or from gambling or betting of any form or nature. No deduction is allowed in respect of any expenditure or allowance under any provision of the Act. Therefore, what this means is that gross winnings are taxable. At what rate? At a flat rate of 30%. Plus, we add surcharge at the rate applicable and 4% HEC on tax plus surcharge. And this is by virtue of section 115 BB. Benefit of UBEL, which we referred which we covered in the topic uh, on uh, computing tax in respect of capital gain is not available here. Deductions under chapter VIA from the gross total income are not allowed from such winnings. But rebate of tax under 87A is allowed in respect of tax on such winnings. Now these provisions are not applicable 
to income from the activity of owning and maintaining race horses in the case of a owner of horses maintained by him for running in horse races this is the distinction we need to keep in mind in respect of such activity and winnings welfare fund where the employer receives employees contribution to provident fund superannuation fund esi fund or any other employee welfare fund right then it is first included as the income under ifos if it is not taxable under the head pgbp then a deduction is allowed to the extent the sum is credited to the employee's account in the fund on or before the due date as per the rules of the fund recollect this provision corresponds to what we discussed in the context of pgbp as well next is income from the letting of machinery plant or furniture following income is taxable as ifos if it is not taxable under the head pgbp if machinery plant or furniture is let on hire then that income is taxable as ifos if not as pgbp income from the letting of machinery plant or furniture and also building so this is a case of composite letting recollect this we have discussed already in the chapter in the topic on income from house property composite rent in such case we need to see if both the lettings buildings as well as machinery plant and furniture are inseparable in such case entire income is taxable as ifos if not taxable as pgvp if this is not inseparable then we need to split and the income from the letting of building is taxable under income from house property while from letting of machinery plant or furniture is taxable as ifos if not taxable as pgvp and we need to allow deduction on account of current repairs insurance premium and depreciation in accordance with the provisions of sections 30 and 32 which we have dealt with in the topic on pgvp sum received under key man insurance policy including bonus it is taxable as ifos if it is not taxable under the head salaries or pgvp sum received by employer is taxable as pgvp sum received by employee to whom the policy has been assigned is taxable under the head salaries sum received by any other person is taxable under this head we have already noted in the topic on exempt incomes that sum received under key man insurance policy is not exempt under section 1010d advance forfeited recollect our discussion on this topic in the context of advance monies in the topic on capital gain so advance which is received in the course of negotiations for transfer of a capital asset is taxable under this head if it is forfeited and the negotiations do not result in transfer if such sum is forfeited before 1st april 2014 it is not taxable under this head but it is deducted in computing cost of acquisition of capital asset while computing capital gain next is compensation if a compensation is received why for say termination of employment or modification of terms and conditions then it is taxable as ifos if it is not taxable under the head salaries or pgvp so compensation received from employer will be covered under the head salaries which is in connection with business or profession it will go in pgvp the other cases will go under ifos family pension family pension which is payable by the employer to whom not to the employee if it is to the employee it will be taxable under the head salaries but by the employer to the family member of the employee in the event of his death that is called family pension it is covered under ifos a deduction is allowed of lower of 1/3 of such income or rupees 15000 undisclosed incomes we refer this in the topic on basic concepts income from undisclosed sources are referred under section 68 to 69d in respect of such incomes no deduction is allowed in respect of any expenditure or allowance or set off of any laws under any provision of the act consequently such income is taxable on gross basis at a flat rate of 60% we have discussed the rates in the topic on rate on tax plus we add surcharge of 25% and then hcc at 4% of tax plus surcharge under section 115 bbe benefit of ubel is not available as is provided in respect of capital gain deduction is not allowed under chapter via from the gross total income in respect of such income 
rebate of the rebate of tax under 87a is allowed but there is an alternative view because of this restriction an alternative view is that rebate under 87a is also not allowed you can follow either view and it will be good to give a note in support of your assumption now we look at certain other instances of incomes which will be taxable under the head ifos remuneration not being remuneration received from the employer because in that case it will be covered as salaries for example remuneration of a mp or mla remuneration for setting question paper for exams etc then award or reward note that award or reward instituted by the government is exempt under 1017a we have noted this in the topic on exempt incomes if it is not exempt it is taxable as ifos rent or revenue from land if it is not exempt as agricultural income payment from unrecognized provident fund on retirement etc right we have discussed this in the topic on salaries that payment from unrecognized pf is taxable when it is received on retirement and we noted there that interest on employees contribution is taxable as ifos in the topic on income from house property we noted that income from letting of vacant land or from subletting of house property is taxable as ifos if it is not taxable as pgbp director's fees is taxable as ifos royalty is also taxable if it is not taxable as pgbp for ready reference let's quickly go through a list of incomes which are taxable under the head ifos now these are some of the incomes which are specifically taxable under this head dividend gifts that is money or property received as gift or for inadequate consideration excess share premium winnings interest on compensation or enhanced compensation the advance forfeited on failed negotiation for transfer of capital asset and family pension certain incomes are taxable under this head if not taxable under any other head interest on securities is taxable under this head if not taxable as pgbp some received as employees contribution to employee welfare fund if not taxable as pgbp letting of machinery plant or furniture belonging to the ssc if not taxable as pgbp some received under key man insurance policy if not taxable as salaries or pgbp compensation if not taxable as salaries or pgbp and any other taxable income if it is not taxable under any other head let's look at certain special provisions there are certain amounts which are not deductible by virtue of section 58 so these are the disallowances in computing income under this head one any personal expense of the sse is disallowed and this corresponds to section 371 of the pgbp two if the sum is payable to a resident and if tds provisions have not been complied with then 30% disallowance is made that is when tax has not been deducted in the previous year or if it has been deducted but it has not been paid on or before the due date to furnish return of income under section 139 1 this corresponds to section 40a ia uh, which we noted in the topic on pgbp excessive or unreasonable payment to a related party is disallowed and this corresponds to 40a2 of pgbp any expenditure for which a payment or aggregate is made to a person in a day which is otherwise than by a specified mode exceeding rupees 10000 is disallowed and this corresponds to what recollect 40a3 in the context of pgbp finally section 59 deals with recovery against reduction already allowed and this corresponds to section 411 recollect the discussion in the topic on pgbp deemed profits arising on recovery against reduction already allowed 411 provisions apply as they apply in computing pgbp income